usual. If you would like us to call you back, that won't happen. Please stand by. <laughs> Please listen closely as our menu has recently changed. Than usual. Welcome to the Ted Alexandro Show, coming to you from the studio headquarters in Astoria, Queens, New York, USA. And my isn't the USA distinguishing itself as we are wont to do. Man, there's a virus amongst us. Hopefully, uh, if you're in the 50 states, you are wearing a mask, even as you listen to this. Take every precaution. But likely, if you are a, a proud, real American, you do not even own a mask at this point, right? Because if we, if we don't believe in it, it's not real. That is, the American, that is the American way. If we just deny it, whether it's science, climate science, a virus, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't really exist. So hopefully uh, you are denying it out of your uh, particular city, neighborhood, but it's, it's unlikely. It's very unlikely. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Ted Alexandro. This is episode three of the Ted Alexandro show. We appreciate you being here. Just to let you know, some exciting things coming down the pike today. Uh, firstly, I want to mention that you can text me. That's right. With your cellular phone, you can text me at 909-575-0737. That will be coming up a little later in the show. I'm just teasing it now. The number is 909-575-0737. You can hit me with whatever, uh, whatever's on your mind, anything that maybe I can uh, help you with or answer for you, that's what this is for. So once again, 909-575-0737. We also, for the first time here on the Ted Alexandro Show, have a distinguished guest. And this is our very first guest. This is someone who is, is uh, an iconic figure in the New York City comedy landscape. And uh, just someone that I have the utmost respect for. He is, uh, we, we know him uh, here at the Ted Alexandro Show as our uh, international correspondent. He is Jeffrey Joseph. He lives up in our neighbor to the north. He, he used to reside here in New York City. He was a New York legend, but he left it all behind. We're going to get into that. 
among other things, but just a beloved figure in the New York comedy scene and someone that I love. So uh, very excited to have our international correspondent, the man, the myth, the legend, COVID free and any other virus, as far as I know, Jeffrey Joseph. So folks, my goodness, here we are. How are you? Are you centered? You don't have to be. It's all right if you're a little askew. You know, throughout the day, I definitely find myself uh, kind of going back and forth, uh, reminding myself that uh, life is just a projection and uh, it is what you make it and all these other things, right? Do you have to, do you have your mantras? Do you have your things that bring you back from the insanity that is our, uh, our every day at this point? I hope you do. I hope you do. If, if only maybe a simple walk, I find that helpful. A walk, uh, some deep breaths, all of these things I think are key. But I do feel good, and I hope you do as well. Uh, obviously, strange days for, for many reasons. Uh, you know, obviously, we have, we have the pandemic still raging, right? Uh, in the 50 states, I think, I think like most of uh, the states, the southern states are making a nice, a really nice surge. Nice to see that, because at first it looked like we were, you know, we up north were really kicking their asses reminiscent of the civil war but wait but wait here comes uh the south will rise again uh with with a a a pandemic virus and um you know maybe maybe this is all just karmic justice right karmic justice is is just maybe this is exactly what we deserve have you ever have you thought that have you thought that for the entirety of american history Like, maybe this is retribution, karmic retribution, and not a moment too soon. The the chickens coming home to roost, or or a bat, or whatever whatever you prefer on your sandwich. And then, of course, we have the the Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives. uh, That is ongoing. Uh, you know, it, it's not as uh, in the streets as it was. It seems as though uh, some of the, you know, that phase of this particular time, you know, because it does surge, right? We've seen it before. Uh, and now, you know, it seems as though like that has kind of uh, tamped down a bit. But no doubt it will, uh, that, that will come back again as, as it always does. So now, like as statues have fallen and things have been renamed, I was just reading that Asheville, North Carolina, uh, enacted uh, reparations uh, of sorts that, um, first of all, it issued an apology for Asheville's role in slavery, and uh, they apologized for systemic racism in terms of housing and uh, voting rights and all these types of things, all of the ways that uh, systemic oppression has reared its head over the years. Asheville, North Carolina, do they have like a thing? What's their, no, they're not weird, right? They're not the make it, that's Austin. But I think Asheville, Asheville's pretty weird too. But just the right kind of weird, man. Weird enough to know that America is, is, is long overdue on reparations and on addressing the many ills of our history. So kudos to Asheville, North Carolina for uh, enacting legislation. I think it was like, I don't know, seven zero in their city council or whatever. So who knows if there's like further steps, then it has to get past the, uh, the clan. The clan gets the final vote on, uh, on everything in, in the United States. So it's a good start, though. It's a good start. 7-0 in the city council uh, in favor of reparations. Uh, It's not going to be like a a payment uh, to citizens. I think it's going to be, as I understood it, uh, infusing funds, funding, resources into black 
neighborhoods, neighborhoods that have historically been oppressed and uh, deprived of such resources and over-policed, no doubt. So kudos to Asheville. Shout out. If anyone is listening down in Asheville, our hats here at the Ted Alexandro Show are off. And uh, if, if, if life ever allows, again, I will come down and uh, I will, I will um, shake every I will shake all seven hands of those city council members. So thank you for leading the way. And hopefully that is the first of many if we can shake hands. If not, I'll stay a safe distance and I'll just give you a namaste. So thank you to everyone uh, involved in that decision. These are the kinds of things that America is long overdue for. Let's hope that it, it, it opens a, a wave, a rolling wave of such, uh, you know, kind of addre- addressing of the historical ills, if you will. And uh, historic, and by historic, I mean like yesterday and also, and also today and also hundreds of years ago. Uh, but intertwined with all of these types of, um, you know, obviously the movements and American history and social justice, uh, I was uh, interested in the recent, and if you're a sports fan, or, or even if you're not, you've probably been paying attention to the Washington Redskins finally agreeing to change their name. Uh, and, you know, while that is in some senses, uh, a small, you know, kind of um, nod towards progress, the same way like all of these statues coming down, uh, you know, people obviously are, are, are hoping that this leads to more substantive changes, but it's changed nonetheless, you know, it, it, to, for the franchise to be renamed. I found it was like really uh, kind of, hilarious and telling that uh washington uh their their basketball team used to be called the nba nba franchise in washington was known as the washington bullets but because of community pressure and i guess gun violence and all of these types of issues washington in i believe it was 1997 so that's what 23 years ago they decided to change their name from the very offensive Washington Bullets to the Washington Wizards. That change was made 23 years ago. Bullets, let's get it out. The Redskins, however, (laughs) our nation's capital, apparently had no issue with uh, a a slur for the, the people who inhabited this soil before uh, Cristofo Colombo, or whatever his name was. Uh, that was one of the few things I learned about Christopher Columbus, other than like the Nina, the Pinto, uh, Pinto and the Santa Maria, was I think his name was Cristofo Colum- Colombo. Am I right? Doesn't matter. He'll be, he'll be gone from the history books soon enough. Though there is a statue here in Astoria that still stands on Astoria Boulevard. Apparently some people uh, had a a protest there surrounding Columbus. You know, they did like a West Side Story. And uh, yeah, the Jets and the Sharks see eye to eye on this now. It only took 50 years for the Jets and the Sharks to get on the same page. They all want Columbus out. So uh, I guess the, you know, isn't it such a great metaphor though? I'm a sports fan. I grew up loving sports, watching sports uh, and have throughout my life. Played a bit of high school basketball until a, uh, a coach with an agenda and a vendetta against me derailed my once promising career. That's my story. Nevertheless, I love, I love sports. I love the humanity of it. However, as the years have gone on, it has grown, for me, increasingly difficult to uh, be a sports fan, right? Because it's all so inextricably linked with capitalism, with billionaires, with uh, 
all of the class socioeconomic issues are so firmly embedded race, obviously so firmly embedded in professional sports. And, and isn't it just, isn't it just, mwah, isn't it just perfect that our nation's capital had a team called the Redskins, right? Just like would not let that go. Uh, and billionaire owner Daniel Snyder just refused. They, I think they took that same approach like the Confederate flag type of uh, people that were, were claiming and justifying the, the Confederate flag as, as uh, honoring our past, right? The, the same kind of notions were being, the bullshit uh, excuses were being thrown around with regard to uh, the the Redskins name that it was in fact uh, the sl the slur is meant to honor uh, the the Indians the Native uh, Americans who came before uh, so yes we we're, when we say Redskin uh, you know we mean that in the in the most respectful way and then you know they probably like would pay some some uh native american guy to come along and say like yeah you know i'm i'm cool with it you know you can always find you can always find the candace owens of every tribe who is ready to say uh yeah you know he's right the billionaire is 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 absolutely right about all of it so i i just find it such a such a ripe metaphor that uh that the, the name of, of the team that plays in the nation's capital in a sport that is a majority African-American, right? Uh, owned by a white billionaire. It's just like, I mean, there's, it's just all too, it's all too perfect. But uh, again, it's a great reminder that you really can't predict anything, right? Would, would you have predicted, uh, you know, six months ago that uh, the Redskins would finally change their name? And, and what led to that? I mean, the, the Black Lives Matter movement you know, the, the, the deaths of all these people, really, and, and the outrage, right? The, the dominoes just fell of like, you know what? There's a lot of other bullshit we want to talk about, which is great, man. I, and I hope, oh, man, I hope the list is long because America has a lot to answer for. And uh, yeah, so, you know, who is it going to be? I saw uh, the onion had a great, had a great thing about the, the name change. They said, um, Daniel Snyder agrees to change the name to the DC Redskins. <laughs> so uh, kudos to the onion for always hitting it out of the park. Um, so that's, that's great to see. And another thing that was interesting is uh, Maya Moore who is uh, plays in the WNBA and is one of the really arguably the, the greatest uh, basketball player of all time in the WNBA. Uh, I think she was like, what was, she's won four NBA championships, league MVP, a finals MVP, six time all-star at the age of 29. Maya Moore walked away from the sport, took a year off to focus on social justice and specifically uh, the case of a, a man who had been wrongly imprisoned. His name is Jonathan Irons, I believe. Uh, so Maya Moore, I mean, she's like, you know, like picture LeBron James essentially taking a year off, you know, or, or Steph Curry. I can't even remember who's good. It's been too long. <laughs> Let's say LeBron James, because everybody knows LeBron. Uh, and, and Maya Moore decided to walk away at, at, at the peak of her career, age 29, said, you know what? I'm going to focus on issues of social justice. I want to make a contribution. I want to uh, step away from professional sport and, uh, and see how I can make an impact off the court. So I think she had a, maybe a family member who was involved in like uh, prison ministry or something. And she, through that, wound up meeting this, this uh, man, Jonathan Irons, I think is his name, Jonathan Irons. 
And he was convicted at age 16 of first degree assault, first degree burglary, armed criminal action charges, uh, which resulted in a 55-0 year sentence at age 16. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, there were no blood, no fingerprints, uh, no DNA evidence, nothing tied Irons to the crime. Irons was a poor black teenager from Missouri, Missouri, uh, and got convicted by an all white jury of his peers. So a 16 year old boy was sent away for 50 years for a crime he did not commit. So Maya Moore uh, met, met this Jonathan Irons, who is now, I, I believe, 40 years old. Uh, so he served, what is, what is the math there? Is that, is, that, is that 23 years, 24 years? So she worked tirelessly with a team of lawyers, and I believe a lot of other people were involved. And just this week, Jonathan Irons, uh, he, he was released. He was released. I think his, his um, conviction was overturned like maybe a few months ago, and he was released this week. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, is there a bigger story in sport than that? I mean, for the, uh, the, the four-time champion, league MVP, you know, I mean, like who, other than Muhammad Ali, you know, who, you know, obviously Colin Kaepernick famously touched off so much of this, you know, the, the, the kind of consciousness of, of athletes. Um, and, and is since, you know, out of, <laughs> out of the league um, for doing so. But Maya Moore, uh, in that vein of, of, of the socially conscious athlete uh really you know um just provides such an example because it's such a rebuke of everything that we're inundated with again in a capitalist system that like kind of you know becoming the lottery winner if you can get your lottery ticket whatever that may be and escape and, and have the life of the, you know, the lifestyles of the rich and famous and, and, you know, be on TV and all of these other things. That's what we're in. That's the message that we're inundated with. And she uh, rebuked all of those messages and said, you know what, uh, I'm going to step away for a year. And I think she said maybe even two now um, to focus on these social justice issues. And, uh, as a result of that tireless commitment, you know, as a human being, uh, and also, of course, bringing the, 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 the attention and the platform that uh, someone who is, um, uh, um, you know, an interla internationally known athlete, bringing that uh, attention probably helped the case as well. But uh, I just think that's such a, to me, that's such a great, and I, and I hope it takes root. And I did read an article that other people are kind of following suit now. Uh, but what a powerful rebuke of like, you know, you have, you have everything, you have it all. You're the, you know, league MVP, a four-time champion. She's like, uh, you know, one of the leading scorers. She's considered, you know, uh, if not the greatest uh, player in the NBA of all time, certainly in, in the discussion. So, uh, yeah, to me, that really resonates um, as someone who, you know, it's I, I'm, she probably didn't mean it this way, but I love a good fuck you to, to the system. Uh, so so kudos to Maya Moore and to all of the people that she will impact with the, with that decision. And, you know, I hope I hope it takes root, you know, in in ways big and small that it's just a, a reprioritization of what is important. And we're seeing that we're seeing that, you know, even for, and, and to just circle back from changing a, the name of a football team, which all these dumb, ignorant people have to cling to because the team that they watch while they're drunk on Sunday, overeating and, and have, have hot sauce. And, and uh, what's the other, the white, what's the white shit that they dip it in? What's that? 
blue cheese yeah <laughs> they just sit there no no we could w- redskins because they're you know why because they're red they have they're red from high blood pressure hot sauce and uh and their team sucks so that's why they're misunderstanding you know what red skin means for them it's like a hypertension obesity and, and a likely heart attack coming sooner than later good riddance to the redskins good riddance and you know hopefully the indians the chiefs the braves all of these these dumb names will follow why don't we you know why not why don't we give uh the the native americans ownership of these teams if if you know if you really want to just give them the team or give them majority ownership and make sure that the people get it i don't want like uh you know the like iroquois llc getting ownership of it you know because there's corruption everywhere even even in those native american tribes like make sure it gets to the people i want give daniel snyder i want you to give half the ownership of the team they probably wouldn't care if you kept the name then right if you give them the real ownership of the team and then uh no but change the name too and and give them the team yeah Give them the whole, actually, not not partial. Give them the whole team. Daniel Snyder, I want you out. I want you, you can sell hot dogs. How's that? You can sell hot dogs. And, and number one, foam fingers. All right, my friends. Wow. I am very excited. Coming up momentarily is our international correspondent. International man of mystery, dare I say. Jeffrey Joseph. But before we get to Jeffrey, I just uh, a couple of announcements. You will be able to text me during the show at 909-575-0737. Text me, text us your questions, anything you need to know, any comments, any things you're wondering, any responses to things you're seeing. Bring it all on. This this show is about you, the viewer, the listener. Bring it all. We're happy to, uh, to answer as best we can. You know, so, some of our uh, knowledge is limited. I'm not going to try to pretend to be an expert on everything, but I can, pre- I can certainly, <laughs> I can pretend actually. What am, I, what am I saying? It's kind of what I do. Um, so that is important. Folks, I also want to remind you, and this is important. I want to remind you to hit the subscribe button on the channel on which you are watching this, the Ted Alexandro show on YouTube. Please hit subscribe. We've got to get our numbers up so that the algorithm can bow down to our will. So please do that now. Subscribe to the Ted Alexandro show. Hit the little bell, the little, the little bell icon so that you get notifications for when we are going live every Monday and Thursday at 7 p.m. So those are two things that uh, I would greatly appreciate. And all, all of us here at the Ted Alexandro Show would greatly appreciate if you hit the subscribe button and you hit the bell for notifications and you will be in the loop for all things Ted Alexandro Show. Also, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. We've got two tiers. Now, what, what is this exactly? This is an opportunity to build something together, okay? This is not a Hollywood production, folks. I am in Astoria, Queens. There is a a Columbus statue not far from here. We're trying to take that statue down, literally, figuratively. We're trying to take down the system, and we can't do that without help from you. So please, if you would, visit patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. There is a $5 level. Uh, the I did it level, you'll get a Zoom AMA. You will get early access to my new comedy special, which just came out. I put it exclusively on Patreon called Cut Up. Uh, you get 20% off merch. Uh, you get the back catalog of all Teddygrams. I believe there were a dozen, maybe a baker's dozen of Teddygrams. 
Uh, you get full downloadable live streams of the Ted Alexandro show, shout outs, uh, podcast topics. You can, you can uh, submit those. Producer Matthew uh, Al Weiss told me I look like Cher when I. If I could turn back time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the $20 tier. This is the as much as you want tier. Uh, you get everything that the $5 tier gets. Plus you get. Drum roll, please. You get exclusive access to the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy. If you're watching this, you likely know that I was once a stand-up comedian. Now I am in semi-retirement. But I've traveled the globe telling jokes to human beings for the better part of two and one half decades. I've traveled all over the world. I've been, where have you been, Ted? I've been in, in, in Turkey. I've been in Amman, Jordan, Kuwait. I've, I've been... Uh, I've been around the world and I, 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 I have got things to share, things to impart. So uh, if you join at the $20 level, there is an ongoing comedy class. Uh, and Matthew, do we have the, uh, do we have the intro for that? We can roll the, the intro if it, if it is sure. queued up. Let's, uh, let's show the folks just a, just a little taste. There you go. Come on. Look Hello at that. Hello and welcome. <laughs> let's, not, hey, let's not give away too much. I mean, just the intro. The intro alone lets you know you are in the hands of a professional. Who wrote that theme song? I, I did. I was, I, did you play the recorder? No, I whistled it. I was desperately searching for my old recorder, but I think I burned it the second I got out of teaching. So uh, that is that is exactly what you will get. You will get an ongoing series of the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy. We are fully accredited. And uh, whether you're just comedy curious or you believe comedy is coming back as a viable <laughs> lifestyle slash career, uh, It'll just be, it's a fun, ongoing conversation. Uh, we'll be talking about the writing process. We'll be talking about uh, finding your voice. Uh, we'll be talking about using your body, your face, your voice. Um, just digging in styles, uh, different styles of comedy. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm really excited, actually. Uh, I swore I would never teach again, but the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy was just too good to pass up. So at the $20 level, patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro, you get full access to the ongoing series, the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy. And there are plenty of other things there, bonus content, behind the scenes content. So check out patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. All right, my friends, I'm excited. Without further ado, Matthew, are we ready? We are ready. Oh, I've been excited about this all day. Even going back, ladies and gentlemen, our international correspondent, let's welcome to the Ted Alexandro Show, the one and only Jeffrey Joseph. Oh, yes. <laughs> there he is. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. You look well. <laughs> you get your own theme song, Jeffrey. 
got to unmute yourself, Jeffrey. Go for it. <laughs> Welcome, Jeffrey Joseph. Hey, man. How are you, sir? I am good, buddy. How are you? Very, very well. Good to see you. Good to be on your show. Good to see you too. You look great, man. What's what's oh. going on? What's going on up there? Hey, man. Free health care. What do you want? <laughs> Legal weed. You're talking uh, about decriminalizing all possession of all drugs. What what, what am I going to be stressed about? You know, you guys huh? are doing it right. You guys are doing it right up there, man. It's it's interesting. I tell you, you're bespectacled, and now that is that's new, right? How long has that uh, been? It's been it's been a slow process of having to accept glasses over the last couple few years. I'm right you behind know, you, buddy. Of, I, you know what I mean? Just just getting made fun of for squinting, which I think that should be <laughs> as bad as fat shaming. That should be as bad as, as anything else. You know, when you look down and you're just trying, oh, yeah, I, I can read this, leave me alone. And they say, oh, no, you can't read. Look at you, look at you. That's shaming. And it How do you still have a... Out. I agree. How do you still have a playbill? That, that's got to be from a year ago because there's no way you saw a production. You're just, you're just that kind of guy. You have a playbill at the ready. You know, it's so funny. I, oh, you know what it was? Is that um, Hamilton? Yeah, it's Hamilton, which is funny too in and of itself. But mm -hmm. I think I opened this box to get a bunch of tax records out of it. And I saw <laughs> oh, my ticket just fell out because... I last saw Hamilton, um, I think, in 2019, and it's uh, it's a tax write-off for $250.50. There you go. Wow. Yeah. You got to hold on to that. Yeah. And I filed my taxes, uh, uh, what was it? Not yesterday, the day before, because somebody's got to pay for these drones. No, they don't pay for themselves, you know. <laughs> ah. Somebody's got to pay for these golf trips. He, he doesn't foot the cost of those. Somebody's no. got to pay for the Goya beans. That's true. That's true. And, and by the way, I'm sure that, you know, there's a, this is a Georgetown Hoyas. I'm pretty sure it's going to now be the Washington Goyas. That's what it's <laughs> going to be instead of the Redskins. It's going to be the Washington fucking Goyas. The name changes are in the wind, my friend. It's in the wind. So let me, let me ask you this now. You, uh, you have been in Canada for, is it two, is years. It two years now? Two years now, yeah. And... Mm -hmm. What was the original impetus? If I'm not getting too personal, what was the what was the original impetus? Because I think of you as like a New Yorker through and through. Like you and I knew each other from the comedy scene in New York. We did a lot of these kind of alt rooms, alt shows together, uh, and you know, always loved seeing what you were up to, seeing what you were working on. Uh, and then, like you know, and this is kind of your mo, by the way. <laughs> all of a sudden i start to hear whispers like uh jeffrey uh jeffrey just like let he ghosted us he just ghosted america can you irish uh, goodbye irish goodbye to america how did that all how did that all come about you know it, it it wasn't i would say as much of a decision as it was slowly testing the waters i was kind of going back and forth spending like a few weeks in in montreal or a few weeks in toronto seeing you know is, is should I make the transition? I, I came to Vancouver a couple of few times, which is where I am now. And every time I came, it just, I just mainly felt really relaxed mm. and calm. And having lived in New York for so long, just that was noticeable that I was <laughs> relaxed, calm, and kind of felt stable. And uh, I was like, okay, this is interesting. And now it's it still, it still vibrant enough a city where I, I feel I felt like I could it could sustain me, but I was just kind of like felt good about it. And had you spent like you had spent enough time uh, prior to that that uh, those cities were on your radar as potential places to live? Oh yeah, absolutely. Those are definitely the. I mean, there are other cities in Canada, but these are the three that I I know the best and. Uh, uh, it was, I mean, they each have a different quality. Obviously, Montreal is, is a bilingual, if not a trilingual city now, because there are like maybe a third of the people speak Spanish and half the people speak French and, you know, like a third of the people speak English. So it's a, it, it's a fascinating city for, for North America, just for that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And Toronto was so much like New York. I was kind of like, mm, it's kind of like a, like a sideways move. But mm -hmm. Vancouver was like, that's something new. That's different. Mm. 
you know? Yeah. So you like, were you just kind of ready for an adventure or were you kind of done with New York or was it a combination of the two? I think uh, I was definitely ready for an adventure, but also I think because I was doing a lot of teaching there and uh, I was doing a lot of teaching about at risk kids and teaching at Rikers Island and um, a lot of other detention facilities and stuff like that. And I was also doing comedy at night and I was also auditioning in my free time and working as an actor. And uh, I think I was just running myself down. Mm. Like I was just running down my battery, except it's hard yeah. to really assess that your batteries run down in New York because everybody else's battery is run down too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, geez, like you uh, took on like probably the three most just draining type of kick you in the ass type. Like if comedy is not bad enough uh, acting and then let me teach at risk kids in, in, in Rikers. Yeah. Like, I mean, God, yeah, you had, was, was it like a, a feeling of burnout? Like, was that like cumulative or did you just reach a point of like, I, I got to get out of here? It, it was definitely cumulative, but I, again, I, I really wasn't able to, to self-assess and nor was I, people weren't coming up to me and saying, oh, you look shit like shit or you look exhausted because <laughs> we were thinking, like- we were thinking it, we were, thinking <laughs> it. We were worried. Uh, the only clue is I was squinting. That's the only clue. Was <laughs> there was squinting. a lot of squinting, yes. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember I, I took a trip to uh, to Victoria, British Columbia, which is a, a much sleepier version of Vancouver on Vancouver Island. And it's just beautiful and it's calm and the, the air is super fresh and it's surrounded by forest. And I got there and I slept for two days straight. Wow. I only got up to eat maybe take a short walk, come back to the hotel room and sleep. I was, my body was just sapped, mm. just completely sapped. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I was like, that, that means something. Yeah. Yeah. And like, to what extent did the things going on in America, uh, you know, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but between like the Trump presidency uh, you know, the, the, black well, well lives first matter. of all, you, you got to know I'm pro Trump. So, right, and, right. No, well, that's what, uh, <laughs> how did it, how did that factor in the fact that you, <laughs> well, how hard I'm, was I'm, it? I'm, to, to I'm, leave? I'm, not, I'm the Canadian distrib- distributor of all things, Donald Trump, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I mean, right. I, I definitely had, uh, maybe even a paranoid premonition of, of the, of what havoc this, goon clown was going to reek upon <laughs> the nation. Mm-hmm. I, I, the, my first sign was uh, I was still teaching in New York when he was elected. Mm-hmm. And the day after the election, I went to visit a friend's school, which is mostly Hispanic. And it's in, it's in New Jersey. It's, it's almost hundred percent Hispanic. And maybe attendance was down 50%. Wow. And just like the a day word of, we, a the day word of gr- we, grieving. Oh, not grieving. Parents were afraid to let their kids leave the house. Wow. They were afraid to let their kids leave the house. He ran wow. a campaign of such hatred that the day after he was elected, even though he had no actual power, they were afraid to let their kids leave the house. Yeah, and that's some that's something that like you you can only get a handle on being in that environment and being amongst that population, right? Otherwise, I mean, you kind of have a sense, obviously, that it's bad news, mm. but but not, yeah, like that That just like drives it home of what the real life kind of consequences are. Yeah. And, and I remember the day after Obama got elected, I also taught that day. And you didn't stay home that day? <laughs> <laughs> no. But there were literally kids in school. And uh, I mean, it didn't have the same effect that it has for us because it was a historical thing. But they, they were just singing all day long, you know, in class. Obama, 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 Obama. So it was a completely different mood. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to sing that song myself from time to time. <laughs> while, to... St- while while you still can. 
while it's still allowed. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. And I hope your studio is in an undisclosed location. I notice that there's no identifying features behind you, which is smart. That's, That's by smart. design. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I also wanted to talk to you about, you know, you touched on uh, teaching at Rikers, teaching at risk students. And I always had such uh, deep respect for you being a former teacher myself. Um, I know how difficult teaching is and how draining it is um, and challenging. Um, and I, I can imagine teaching at Rikers comes with its own set of challenges. And also in the context of, uh, I don't know how much if you were watching earlier, but I was talking about uh, WNBA player Maya Moore uh, mm. le leaving, uh, you know, this uh, successful career, kind of leaving at, at the height of her, you know, she's age 29, uh, very successful and working on issues of criminal justice. And, you know, I, and I think of you as someone, you know, you, you know, and I want you to take this all in. I don't want you to, uh, to brush it aside. Uh, someone who's such a gifted actor, comedian, um, but for you to also put your considerable talents in that direction is really just as much, uh, you know, uh, uh, and more so in fact than, uh, than Maya Moore, because you, you had this wealth of, of knowledge and your, your, your acting uh, background and, and all of the experiences you've had in the business. And you chose to bring that into a prison classroom. Uh, so I, I just have such uh, immense respect for you and for that decision. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? Um, it's interesting. Um, I kind of fell into it, if, if you can fall into such a thing. But I, I had a, I, I had done a, a, a play reading at, at Ensemble Studio Theater. And there were all and I had replaced an actor who something had happened and who knows. And, uh, and the play was written by one of the teaching artists at Manhattan theater club. And so the, all the big Manhattan theater club people came and, uh, they saw me that night and they were like, uh, this is going to sound weird to you, but <laughs> the playwright and all, all of us, we, we, we were teaching artists and we go into all these locations and we kind of bring, our expertise as uh, theater makers to the classroom. And would you be interested in joining us? And uh, I'd never done anything like that. So I said, yeah, I, I'll give it a shot. And I kind of just got sucked in from there, you know? Hmm. Yeah. And how long did that go on for? How long, how long oh, did you teach? I think more than a decade, more than 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Until, until I couldn't see well anymore. <laughs> they, had, they had to ask you to leave <laughs> so uh you know obviously um you know comedy has its own rewards acting has its own rewards um and challenges mm. uh what what uh what did you kind of like how like what what, uh, how did that impact you? Like what lessons did you take with you from that personally? And then maybe even, um, things that like changed, changed you, uh, from, from do, cause it is such a specific, you could have done it once and, and, and said like, all right, thanks for that opportunity, but you did it for 10 years. Yeah. I think, I think the thing, the, the number one thing is, uh, when you're teaching in an environment like that, it kind of takes all of you. So, you know, I may have done some writing for TV. I may have done some acting, may have done some stand up. Well, it takes all of that to try to communicate something to someone who initially might have a great deal of resistance in receiving it, the information you, it takes everything you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there's, there's something exciting uh, and energizing about the challenge of that. And then when you deal with certain populations of, of, of kids, I mean, in a way, they're really crying out to you. 
to to make a connection and to to give what you have and uh when that exchange takes place it feels pretty fucking great <laughs> mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh, you reminded me of a story of a uh, uh, with this one kid i used to get the kids to write plays and we perform the plays and as this was in rikers island and uh I'm, I'm sitting with this kid and at a certain point he just doesn't want to write anymore so the big excuse and this excuse starts in the first grade and it goes all the way to when you graduate is mr mr i can't write no more my wrists hurt man my wrists hurt i can't you know it's like the, the wrist injury mm-hmm. i can't you know take me to the medic my wrist hurt i can't right and uh at that moment, somebody came in with a waffle, which is the waffle in prison. So the kid was like, oh, I want a waffle. I was like, man. Like, the, said, like the breakfast food? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a frozen waffle somebody put in a toaster, but still like, what, a waffle in jail? And he stood up to get his waffle. I said, dude, sit down. I was like, writing is food for the soul. And he said, mister, my soul is full. It's my stomach that's empty. <laughs> <laughs> you met your match yeah i met my match and they're like write that down <laughs> that's a great line <laughs> but the, the funny thing is with a lot of these kids especially kids from new york city they have such a facility with language that's completely yeah. unacknowledged right completely unacknowledged they have such a good ear for for hearing language and for transcribing it and for making musical language because that's what's kind of going on in the street that's the vibe of the street you know yeah, uh, they have such yeah. a good eye for trying to discern what the hell is going on in a situation like that they they're good judges of character in some way like they can look down the street and be like oh i don't like that way that guy's moving i'm gonna go to the other side of the street hmm mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. something's going on there that's a transaction they can see things that mm-hmm. like if I went to work in a when I went to work in a, a suburban school, they didn't have that facility. They didn't have that that capability at the ready because they didn't need it to survive. So if you're teaching something like drama, you have to right away right, right, it kind of behooves you to sh- to to let people know, A, you've got a facility with language and B, you understand what behavior is and mm-hmm. how to read behavior. And these are two very important things in drama. So you can probably write this thing. You can mm-hmm. probably write this. You know, you kind of empower them with the gifts that they already kind of have and they they can take off. Yeah, yeah. And isn't it fascinating like that, uh, you know, teaching and specifically teaching in, in those types of uh, institutions and those populations and, and uh, in, in a different way, obviously, comedy and acting uh, puts you in, it drops you into all of these situations where you said like uh, it, it requires all of you and, and it's like a clean slate each time, right? Whether it's a production or certainly in stand up, uh, every time you have a gig. Uh, and, and I would imagine with teaching, uh, you know, certainly for me, uh, though it was, it was not in, in, in Rikers, uh, you know, like you do, ha- it, you do have to be present and it's, it's like a, you know, it's almost like you have no accumulated you know, you like you're all, you're always yeah, exactly. like having starting from zero. Is is that yeah. a, is that an accurate description of like kind of all like all three of those in a certain sense? That's a very accurate description because especially teaching in a place uh, like Rikers, where a you don't even know if you're going to get into the classroom that day. Like from the moment you show up, everything is a maybe. Like you show up, you have to go through the the security thing, and if there's anything happening anywhere in the prison, you're not getting. It. Wow. You show up, you go through the security thing. If the, if the corrections officer at the gate has an attitude, you might not get in. Um, huh. You show up, there's a huge line. Maybe there's a scuffle in line because of some kind of visitation day. Maybe you're not going to get in. Or maybe you're going to get in and there's another slow up at another gate as you're getting there. And maybe you get in and you're in, you're in classroom for just the last 20 minutes of a class. It's like, so by the time you get into class, you've already gone through so much stress and and and, and toil that, and wow. then the classroom is exactly the same thing all over again. You don't know which kid's going to be in the class. Like you're excited to see a certain kid because he was supposed to work on this thing and he wanted to work on it, and then they're like, "Ah, oh, he's not here today. He, he got a last minute court date. They had to take him out, or or he got in a fight at the house, so that he can't come today. Or there was a fight at the house that he had nothing to do with, so he can't come today. So." Everything or he, is constant. Or he got a hold of some waffles. 
<laughs> oh, there was a waffle. A waffle. <laughs> Everybody leave. Everybody leave. Everybody out. CEOs leave for waffles. <laughs> <laughs> so now, like in this time of, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives, uh, this kind of cultural shift and this awareness of mass incarceration and the kind of behemoth of capitalism that commodifies black and brown bodies the way that it does. Um, I guess two things. One, like, is, is, is it dissimilar in Canada? And uh, also, like, do you, do you find yourself hopeful in this moment uh like what, what emotions you know if if it's not too personal to ask like what what uh, like what is your kind of um where have you been at with uh this kind of wave of of the movements that have been coalescing well i think uh it was amazing to watch the whole series of protests unfold the way they did and it was surprising in one sense and not surprising in another because this level of tension and oppression and the resultant animosity had just been building and building and building and building and building and building and building. I remember um, maybe going back to, I was living in Brooklyn maybe, maybe was it 20 years ago as much? Have you been in Canada that long? No, this is Brooklyn. <laughs> Maybe 20, 20 years, eight, eighteen years. And I remember there was there was all this stuff going on with the police there, and there were like kids going around. This is before like there were good cell phone cameras, so they had camcorders, and they would uh, right. they would film the police, and there would be fights like the, between the police and the camcorder people, like cop watch kind of stuff. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was unofficial, uh-huh, and uh-huh. but there was a lot of tension about that, you right. know. Right. Right. A lot of tension. And watching that to go from there to the point where now the average Joe, it doesn't take a committee, it doesn't take somebody to find out where the thing is happening and then rush to that point with a camera. Now the average Joe just pull, pulls out a camera and just clicks it. And we have undeniable proof to all except the most hardened racists that uh <laughs> cause God, yeah. what happened before that <laughs> well i want to know what happened before yeah <laughs> yeah there's always another yeah. side right yeah what happened <laughs> oh and when he was in the seventh grade he got a d <laughs> so he's probably he's yeah oh, Jesus Christ. you can't that's argue right. with these fuckers. that's right <laughs> but yeah but you have you have you know evidence that can be beamed across the world of, of exactly what's happening in the streets and what, what, what the relationship is between the police and, and, and the people they're supposedly working for. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's been amazing to watch the, the energy that's come out of that, out of yeah. all this, this, this incontrovertible truth that the people who've been over-policed have always known. And we've always tried to share our, our stories. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. It, yeah. And, and I mean, Trayvon Martin was, uh, what, eight, eight years ago. Uh, Eric Garner was five years ago. Sandra yeah. Bland was, you know, so it's mm-hmm. like, it's been this gradual, you know, kind of awakening, I guess, for, for the, for the mainstream to the point mm-hmm. that now I think, I don't know if it's like 75% or something, uh, uh, favorable, like that, you know, people are in, in, in favor of the black lives matter movement or something like that. Some, something yeah. I read. but that yeah but it like you said uh, obviously uh communities who are experiencing over policing uh, (laughs) knew this cameras or not you know um so Uh, yeah and did i i don't mean to cut you off were you did you have another no go ahead i I was just gonna ask like uh what is because i i have seen some obviously some protests and things of that nature in canada and canada in different cities how would you kind of say the overall vibe is about uh, Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, the movement for Black Lives? Well, it, it's fascinating being an African-American from the States in Canada now because um, 
obviously there, there are black people in Canada and there's undeniably some level of oppression in Canada and some level of over-policing of black people in Canada. And yet for me, compared to the level of violence and over-policing that goes on in the United States, this is like a fucking vacation for me. Dude. Wow. <laughs> it's like a fucking vacation to see yeah. a police officer or to have a police officer drive by and not feel like, fuck, it's a cop. I know I'm not doing anything wrong, but it's still a cop. To feel nothing. To actually initially missing the fact that this guy wasn't staring back at me and feeling like something's wrong. Like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, he's not looking at me. <laughs> that feels weird. Right, yeah. right. It took, yeah. it, took a, it took a year of driving before finally I was stopped by the police. The guy pulls up next to me and he does like this, which, which here in Canada means roll down your window. I know in America it's this, but um, so I rolled down my window and I'm like, oh fuck, here it comes, what? And he's like, hey buddy, um, your lights aren't on. Turn your lights on for me, all right? And then he just drives away and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, bro? Right. That's it? <laughs> No, get out of the car. Let me run you a shit. Your lights wasn't on. You done fucked up now. You're like, you're ready for the you whole know, the yeah. whole show. It's 8.02 p.m. Them lights ain't on, motherfucker. Oh, boy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Spread oh, them man. cheeks. You know, it was, just, it was just like, turn your lights on, buddy. And he drove away. It yeah. was actually helpful. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm happy to be here. I mean. It, it's been a challenge for me sometimes to listen to some of my, Af my African Canadian friends to hear about their uh, run-ins with uh, racism and oppression because I, I I feel like oh that's I'll take it I'll take it <laughs> right. <laughs> I've, right I've I've left I've left some such an abusive relationship oh that I'm man gonna be up here and just be kind of semi abused or teased I'm like okay that's good I'll take sure. It. Yeah. Sure. And especially coming, I, I would imagine, uh, you know, the NYPD is, is kind of notorious. And, and the LAPD. Right. I mean, I, I lived in LA for a while and they were, they, they definitely took the cake. Yeah. They definitely yeah. took the cake for just militaristic kind of Nazi uniformed, uh, kind of jackbooted. Yeah. You know, they they had no problems pointing their guns at you and then telling you to get the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, they were they're they're hard. Yeah. So uh, would you would you say that like for you there's a shift? Is is there a, a hopefulness around around this? Um, like I'm 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 still a cynical bastard. That's why I escaped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same camp. I'm in the same camp. That's why I got the hell out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's so hard to look forward and to see what might happen. I mean, hopefully there's some kind of leverage that, that, that's going to be used, but there's just so much fucking happening in the world with mm -hmm. this guy who's, who, who's been able to run America into the ground in fucking three and a half years. I mean, the, yeah. you know, just the coronavirus is enough and the fear around that is enough to distract anybody from almost anything else. I mean, the complete ground grinding to a halt of the economy is enough to, yeah. To, you know. Yeah. In a sense, like you, you knew that he would fuck things up. You knew that was coming, right? Like if you're a thinking yeah. Yeah. aware person, you knew yeah. some form of insanity was coming, but you, even this is beyond like, you know, this is even beyond what like you could have. M. Night Shyamalan is like, whoa, that's a twist. <laughs> what? Whoa, honey, watch this. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Very, very bizarre. But let me ask, let me ask you a little bit about um, your, your, your work, your acting career, your, your comedy. Um, you know, you've done, you're one of those guys that have done so much. Um, you know, you'll just pop up and, you know, uh, obviously things like every Christmas we're watching Scrooged <laughs> right, 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 and right. there's, there's Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, 
and you know classic shows li- like um um why am i forgetting um what would we do baby without us family uh, ties? michael j family ties yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> uh family ties and and so many other so many other things uh and teachers lounge it bears mentioning. oh man <laughs> you know that's a, that, and and that was such a fun time with y'all and that was such a it great was. great just, it's just great man it's, it's I've, I've watched it again and again and like so many of the episodes are great and the stuff we all did together was great jim was great Hollis was great it was such a <laughs> it you know, was thank you and uh, yeah. you know you and matt the director really let let us all rock and it was just so lively and, and fun man. thank you yeah it meant yeah. a lot when you when you said yeah. i remember you said that on set you were like you guys run a really good set here yeah i turned to Hollis. i was like i guess we're running a, i guess we're running a good <laughs> set <you know? laughs> so yeah no i'm and oh, honestly yeah. <laughs> 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 that's matthew oh, um, oh yeah. there he is yeah <laughs> hey man yeah and oh, when not- um you know what just it was such a, like the day that you came in to film it was you know it was uh hollis and i and jim gaffigan and uh you just like kind of recalibrated the it's like oh man like jeffrey like a real actor is on <laughs> Everyone, your attention, please. <laughs> we have a real actor on set. Yeah. It was just like uh, I was simultaneously, um, you know, acting, but like just like watching, watching you too. Oh, so yeah, it was man. it was so fun. Um, well, it's it's great when somebody lets you rock. That's for sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I walk on to another set and they'll say, "Oh, that's that's great. You can do that. Put that all in a very small little bag." right right so like how how uh has acting um kind of like how did that become your you know your path your um vocation your you know like your calling you know because it is you know there's people that you see that are actors and then there's people that are you know like when I watch you work in, in anything that you do and in stand up as well, because you bring this to stand up, uh, you just really inhabit. There's there's a there's an ease with which, you know, I can be talking to you off stage or, you know, off camera or whatever. And then when it's time to work, you. You inhabit you. It comes from, you know, it comes from your uh, source. Like, so how, oh, how, okay. how has that how, that, that, how what was the, the process of that? Moment. Oh man, I just, uh, <laughs> uh, I remember, I remember when I, when I was doing stand up a whole lot, like a whole lot, you know, you, like, like, like Ted Alexander level, you know, <laughs> you're doing three or four shows a night. Let me think back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember times where I would walk into a room and, um, I mean, this was after I was doing it a few years and I would walk into the room. And I could feel the room. Mm. Like you can feel humidity or you can feel something hot or you can feel something cold. It was mm. like I could feel the temperature of the audience. Like, oh, they're this tonight. Or, oh, they're that tonight. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and yeah. I, think, I think taking advantage of that, that kind of very subtle connection that we start to develop with the audience is, is, is what kind of turns things around for a performer. Because a lot of people, they're talking to the, they're talking at the audience. You know, did you thing with that? Because my voice has changed now, and now I'm this guy, and that, blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, that's, right. that's one way to go about it. And the other way is what you do, which is, I'm here, and I'm talking to the people there. <laughs> and, and I'll I've get started, I'll get started say, eventually. So <laughs> over fun. Exactly. You know what I mean? That there's, we're all kind of in this together. You know? Right, right. Yeah. So, so for you, like, um, it, do you delineate between the, the acting and the, and the stand up, or is it, is it all kind of the same thing? I mean, the immediate, the immediacy obviously of stand up, um, you know, having done a, a little bit of both, uh, yeah. the immediacy of stand up is, uh, the, for me, the appeal of, like you said, oh, just yeah. showing up in the room, yeah. feeling it, and you know, you're going to be on in 10 minutes or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing about being a stand up is, is you're so many things. I mean, you're definitely the actor, you're the writer, you're the director, <laughs> you're the yeah. transpo guy, 
<laughs> right. And your craft services, you got to get your drink or whatever. You know, you do, you, 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 you you're the whole fucking crew and then you yeah. got to speak into the microphone. You got to do all the whole fucking thing. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, you know, it takes all of you. It takes all of you. But yeah, there is, I think there's a difference inside of uh, something's happening uh, slightly different inside when you act, uh -huh. especially when you act on film because you're, you just, you're, you're, you're much more intimate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there's no need to project anything. And right. almost sometimes a need to, to try and cover up something that's welling up in you or something that, that you're creating. But in stand up, you're like, I'm letting it go, I get to let it go, I let it go. If something comes back, I let it go, it comes back, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, it's live performance, it's call and response. It, it, to me, it's, it's more like teaching. Hmm. Not, not, not that I'm trying to educate the audience, but in, that you got to be alert in the room and deal with anything that's going on in the room in order to get your message across. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. I've, I've felt that many, many times as well. And I'm grateful for the, I'm grateful to be done with it, but I'm also grateful for the years that I spent in the classroom, uh, kind of yeah. honing that, like, you know, that public speaking skill, but also the holding, you, cause you have to mean what you're saying, right. In, in both things, you really like right. it, people can sniff if you're like phoning it in. Now with, uh, with acting, was there, have, can you point to one experience? Like you talked about the fun of like, kind of being like, you know, you can play or whatever. Have you had like a, you, like one or two, you know, anything that pops to mind of like transcendent experiences in acting where, where uh, you know, either the, the quality of someone you were working with, another actor, director, Mm. Uh, that you f you felt like you know uh, it was just it was all right there. Interesting question. And when you said that, I I, I immediately went to thinking about acting class because I think those might have been the first time I felt those transcendent experiences, and so mm. those are the ones that I remember most powerfully. Because it's mm. the first time you do it where you're like, whoa, what the fuck? I just, yeah. it was just flu. I just, I, you know, I, yeah, I knew all the lines and I knew the blocking, but something else happened. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that didn't seem like it, like, it's like I wasn't even there. <laughs> yes. You know, I wasn't there. Something else was there. Right. So I definitely remember that from some acting classes where I was like, start a scene and then end a scene and be like, that was a journey, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know? Yeah, that's such a good point, right? Because then, then it's also the thing of like, well, how do I do that again? Like, the, <laughs> exactly developing exactly. some sort of uh, yeah. skill or craft. There, uh, there's a famous Laurence Olivier story about that, where he he gets off stage and people are like, "That was amazing!" Like after a certain night, "That was amazing! That was amazing! That was amazing!" And he goes into his dressing room and he just destroys his dressing room, and people are like, "What's wrong?" He's like, "I have no idea how to do that again." <laughs> yeah, yes. I, yeah, I don't know what I did, and I don't know how to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow, baby. <laughs> Jeffrey, can uh, can we take uh, a couple of texts from people uh, because yeah, yeah. Pe people uh, are are texting in? So, uh, folks, do you have um, do you have some texts? Text us now for some questions. First for Jeffrey Joseph, and uh, and if I can if I can weigh in, uh, I, I will. I'll, I'll say hello to John F. O'Donnell, who's who's in the. I see. Ah, him John, hello. yes, <laughs> my man, yes, yeah, man, love you, John. That's J Fod, high, high energy, high octane comedian. He brings it, man. <laughs> yeah. That that is a that is a hurricane of funny, as I have said. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have something here. Uh, love the show. Uh, about the subject of day after Trump was elected. I was vice president of PTA and volunteered daily at my son's school uh, all the way over here in Oregon. And our school is 50% Latino kids and kids were in tears in the hallways, <sighs> hugging their friends goodbye, thinking they'd be deported. Uh, uh, and fuck Trump, LOL. Oh, man. No, no need to put LOL in, but... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah... That yeah. instant level of fear that he brought to people, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and Holy I think... Holy fuck. Right, and I think 
I think that's like, again, a level of, um, you know, people like bristle at the word privilege, right? But like, I really think it's hard for white people to, uh, to contextualize what that might feel like, that existential kind of, you know, I mean, obviously, every, nobody is immune from trauma or from, you know, um, harrowing life experiences, but like to be othered by the, the country you live in, the country you're a citizen in is, mm -hmm. uh, I think, foreign to, to most white people. Yeah, that's why they, why they didn't get it. I mean, I love Bernie Sanders, but he didn't get it. Love John Stewart, but he didn't get it. They were like, this is about people's economic anxiety, but anybody who was black or, or, or brown who was watching Trump on his ascendancy to the presidency was like, this is about fucking racism. This is a posse forming. <laughs> you know, you, you felt it in your body, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I think, I think white people just didn't have that level of instinct because they're not used to being hunted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a heavy word, but it's, it's right on the money. It's yeah. right on the word. Yeah, and I mean, you, you saw what Trump is doing now where he wants to now deputize citizens as... Yes, yes, for ICE, uh, right, to, to, uh, deputizing. It, it's, it, to me, you know, what? I, I immediately thought of George Zimmerman uh, with Trayvon Martin, right? Like yeah, deputizing yeah. these people that ha have otherwise have no, essentially like your white skin or in the case of, uh, you know, Zimmerman, I, th I think was uh, Latino. Part, but, part, part Latino, yeah. Yeah, he was enough white. But he was trying to get into the club. He was trying to get into the white club. Yeah, of course. If you're on like neighborhood watch in Florida, you're, you're basically white. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I did read about that that thing of uh, Trump wanting to. Uh, there's some sort of like, I don't know if it's like a four week, probably not even four weeks, but there's some sort of deputization no, four weeks you, four weeks you can be a police captain it's got to be a little bit less than that <laughs> <laughs> You're not yeah yeah it's um, frightening man someone asked for our thoughts on the 2020 election uh what 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 do you have any <laughs> I, I think i think life is going to be so tense between now and then that's that's my my prediction and and not not just in the united states but in the world because the, the yeah. influence that the United States has throughout the world is just so profound and, and constant. And, uh, yeah. and everybody is waiting to see what's gonna happen. Uh, I mean, to, to be in another country and to watch the news of America is, mm -hmm. is, is, is a surreal experience. Like I, I watch parliament happen here in Canada and there are three or four major parties. And every couple of days, the leaders of those parties, which includes the prime minister, have a vigorous debate on, on any given subject in two fucking languages. <laughs> <laughs> they all speak both languages. They all are pretty well apprised of all the facts. If anybody makes the slightest mistake, everybody else gangs up on them. It's like and that's, live that's it, televised, you said? Yeah, yeah. So it's like to watch that. I mean, whether I agree with these people or not, they're all capable human beings. Right. Then they're not, for instance, debating. They're not like arguing with science or something like that. They're not <laughs> arguing about about whether or not we're going to help people. They're, they're arguing about fine tuning the response. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, and then to turn it on and to watch fucking Trump and that 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 cavalcade of clowns that he has out there as his emissaries is is just like, I think for anybody in the world, anywhere else in the world, it's just like what. How is this passing muster? And then, you know, on the other hand, we have Biden, who's, you know, he's like the slightly better version of Trump. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah. he's, 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 hold, you know, he's out of all the ca candidates in that field, he was the most Trump like. And sure. that's the one. That's right, the yeah, one right down goes. to the sexual uh, assault <laughs> yeah. allegations, right? So it's like, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm, He's getting my vote. I get, I get my little absentee ballot. I'm voting for fucking Joe Biden, but uh, <laughs> hopefully he'll pick a great vice president, and 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 then you know something will happen to him. He'll win, and then. Who knows? 
watch this, Jeffrey. You can text us at 909-575-0737. Uh, and you can ask us a question. 909-575-0737. Um, now, Jeffrey, I know you to be uh, like kind of a spiritual guy as well. We've talked about like when you, you did uh, Tai Chi and uh, I know you to have that kind of inner life and stuff. Uh, I find myself so often now uh, splitting between the world, the physical world in which we live, the reality, and, uh, you know, trying to, in essence, zoom out and uh, think about the spiritual lessons and uh, Trump perhaps just embodies uh, a part of all of us and embodies American history in some ways. And right. The, uh, the, the larger themes of like uh, perhaps Trump and Biden are the precise candidates that the only candidates that, that this system in this country could have produced. Um, so do you find yourself like, um, musing on on the spiritual lessons of it all and also follow up how do you these days find yourself taking care of your mental health and your you know just your spiritual life the stability aspect of all of this well i think it's really interesting you point out that duality because i I feel that duality i I feel like my paying attention and my being involved in in politics and in whatever activism that's going on in black lives matter and all these things is, is seems to be one very specific reality and my attending to them on social media seems to be one specific reality and those both are very upsetting realities and then i have another reality where i can go meditate or i can go do something of of a spiritual nature and i just feel great and refreshed (laughs) and (laughs) and it's like it's 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 almost like all these things are, are are happening at the same time, and you can choose which one to give your attention to, and they're all worthy of your attention. Mm. They all are. So, but it's nice yeah. to be able to take a nice cool dip and 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 something spiritually refreshing. Yeah, and I guess sure. in some sense, your your decision to move to Canada was informed yeah. by that impulse, right? Ab- absolutely was. Absolutely yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah, man. Let's see. We have uh, one more here. I'm, uh... Hey, man, I think you're going to need those glasses. I see this little movement with your head. You got a little comeback. I got to go back a little bit. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And believe me, I've got this thing pumped up to the highest font. <laughs> the question is, I'm at work trying to listen fully. What does that mean? I don't know what that means, like with your full self? Uh, like, Yeah. <laughs> whatever whatever you're bringing is is enough is enough <laughs> what's your guest's name my guest's name <laughs> now, who is this guy i need to know this is jeffrey joseph actor comedian teacher seeker extraordinaire make uh do, do yourself a favor and and follow jeffrey joseph on social media um when he decides to dip into that cesspool, <laughs> <laughs> when I guess, you know, when he's between worlds, he, he comes in, <laughs> comes into social media um, and ask if Jeffrey, I'm putting your name in. He said, ask if he took the ferry to Victoria yet. I think you alluded to that. Oh right? yeah. That's a beautiful ride, man. It's, it's, it's one of my d- dreams to, there are a couple of islands between here and Vancouver Island, which are just, which are small, uh, barely habited, m- much wooded, and just surrounded by, by, by ocean and fresh air. And it's like, and there's a little city boy would love to have a cabin on, on a, in a place like that. Mm. And, and let it just rain. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Wash it all away, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here's hoping that dream comes true. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. What about how do, how do you view social media? Because it is such, you know, it is such a complex and obviously ever present uh, entity 
in our lives, you know, as entertainers, uh, it, it kind of comes with the terrain. We, we, I don't want to say we have to, but you know, there is an element of like for, for the, for the job we have to. And I think you do, you straddle the line nicely of the things that you write on Twitter, Facebook, um, you kind of elevate the discourse of, of what can otherwise be like, uh, like I said, a bit of a cesspool. Uh, what, what is, <laughs> what is your approach to, um, to social media? Cause I do, I do very much appreciate your voice on there. I think, I think that, I mean, you know, one of the things that's very addictive, especially in these times is being comedians is posting something on social media and then getting responses because it's, you know, because it's like, Oh, I need, I need that. Still got it. <laughs> exactly. I still got it, man. The likes, the whatever people writing things down or responding to that. It's like, this is the closest I'm going to get to being on stage actually, <laughs> even though it's in a digital format. Yeah. Uh, and that part is fun. And that part I, have to, I also have to acknowledge is very addictive because right. I'm, I'm checking, I'm, I'm staying involved, I'm staying engaged. It, it's half in my mind. Uh, I should be thinking about something else, but I keep coming back to it and I come back to it too much. Mm. And, and I, just, I just try to observe that process of what's going on in me. And mm. I also, besides trying to write jokes, I also try to comment on that process of, of, of how I feel about social media and what it's kind of doing to me. Cause I, it's, it's yeah. doing something. Yeah. It's yeah. Doing something. It, it, it's right. like now when I pick up my phone, I'll have an intention to pick up my phone and I'll be like, I'm going to, I'm going to go on Instagram and I'm going to answer Ted's message. And I open Instagram and this picture pops up. It's not Ted. It's somebody else. And I'm like, Oh, let me click that. And let right. me click that. And then I click 10 things and I'm like, I came on here for something. Right, right. And then, oh, to, to answer Ted's message. But they, <laughs> yes. they send you through this whole fucking world. They got yes. the algorithm. They know what yeah. appeals to your eye. They keep you moving and moving and moving. And your brain just becomes scattered all over the place. Yeah. And that, I, I noticed that happening a lot. And it's concerning me. Yeah, because on the one hand, you know, especially during these specific times, which to me are kind of unprecedented in, in my lifetime. I'm 51 like uh, things are so heightened already as it is, you know, the pandemic, the numbers growing, the uncertainty of, you know, uh, of life in, in, in the larger sense, but uh, then even the, you know, all of the elements of life, whether it's performing, um, just <laughs> walking down the street, going running errands in a, in a, mm -hmm. you know, normal way. Uh, yeah, just the heightened anxiety, uh, and then also the the social movements, the the kind of duality of the exhilaration of of uh, humanity breaking through to to hopefully something new. You know, mm. victories are so few and far between. You know, so that when you have those moments of of real, you know, things coalescing and and something new appearing, it is so invigorating. And in that sense, I, you know, I do cherish what social media offers uh, in that, like, we can't, like, I can check in with you. I can check in with, you know, comedy is such a community, right? We like people, like you said, people just pop up in our feeds now, like people like, yeah. you know, maybe you otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. uh, come across or think about. Uh, so there is like something beautiful about whether it's family, friends, colleagues, old friends uh, uh, that, that th those ties that bind, um, and, and process, you know, that, that may be communal processing of, of the bizarre nature of things now, but yeah, it is a fine line because it can become like uh, crazy making with, um, just the nature, like you said, the algorithm and, and, you know, arguing online too, and all oh, of the, the pitfalls. Man, especially the arguing online. I, my, I noticed this trait in myself. Like if I have something to do, that's making me a little anxious about the day you know, something real life to do. I notice that I'll get on social media before I do that thing and I'll initiate or join an argument. And now I'm glued to the argument. No, no, I'm committed to this thing. I, I better answer this. And oh, he said this, and so I better say this. And the thing that I'm really anxious about doing is it recedes further and further back because I'm, a, I'm in the very important work 
and arguing right. about what the Washington Redskins' new, new name should be. And I, right. I think I have some important things to say about this. <laughs> and I'm lost. I'm gone. It is you know? funny how that can happen, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up with uh, a final question. Has Jeffrey ever performed at Helium Portland? If not, it's close enough to Vancouver. He should. Have you been I, to uh, Helium in Portland? I have not. Um, I would love to come down. Of course, when, you know, people can go out and do things again. But also, right now, you know, our border's closed. So I can't. All right, right. I can't come down to the, to the land of COVID. Unfortunately. Yeah. So, lucky you. Lucky yeah. you. So, but when I can, I will. I, I, I really like Portland. Yeah. yeah. And your, your, sir, your beard belongs in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I left my beard in Portland. <laughs> the Tony Bennett song. Yeah. yeah, man. <laughs> well, pal. You're, you're just one plaid shirt away from living in the Pacific Northwest, my friend. You know, you I forget it. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, believe me, it's, uh, it's a dream. It's a dream. It could, I, I have to, I think I have to up my hip level. Uh, the, beard, <laughs> the beard is solid, but I have to like get a microbrew going or something, you know? <laughs> well, pal, what a pleasure. Thank you for being our first guest here on the Ted Oh, thanks for having show. me, man. I love you, dude. I, I really I love, love you. I love you too. Yes. I love watching you perform. I love what, what I love how you feel and the things you say. Uh, and, and, um, it's, it's just such an honor to be here with you, bro. I love you too, buddy. And and we did talk about we're going to... Oh, we're gonna Matt Weiss you... is playing me off. Can oh, you believe this fuck guy? Fuck him. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> we take back everything we said, Matthew. All right. Good to see you. I'm, I'm getting off the couch now, Johnny. <laughs> love you, buddy. We'll see you again soon. Love you, man. Bye. Jeffrey Joseph, everybody. <laughs> the man. The myth. The legend. I love that guy. Very, very much. We wrote that song specifically for Jeffrey. Shout out Pro Pro DLC, who provides all the music for the Ted Alexandro show. But uh, I do feel as though Pro Pro DLC channeled that for Jeffrey Joseph. Um, Thank you, Jeffrey, for joining us. I mean, you guys saw for yourself. You heard for yourself. Jeffrey is a, is a, is a wise sage, a, a funny, funny man, a good man, uh, a man that I learned from. You know, I, I, I do love him like a brother and uh, just feel really, I feel really fortunate to have crossed paths with Jeffrey on this earthly plane. Uh, just a funny, uh, I mean, as viciously funny as, as they come but as good a heart as you'll find. So thank you, Jeffrey Joseph, our international correspondent. He will be back, friends. Uh, Folks, you are watching the Ted Alexandro Show, and I implore you to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube, and also ding the little bell. You You gotta hit the bell so you get the notifications so you know when we're going live Monday and Thursday at 7 p.m. every week. And uh, what else did I want to tell folks? Uh, Make sure that you are following me on social media. Um, Also, um, my album, my new album, Cut Up, is is available on all of the streaming platforms. Spotify, you can follow me on Spotify. All the things that you can do to engage are appreciated. You know, if there's an option to click a thumbs up, I think Pandora has thumbs up. So when you're listening to my stuff on uh, Pandora, just do whatever you can do because we're trying to build, like I said, we're trying to build something special here and it's happening. It's happening. Do you feel it? I do. It's happening. Thanks to people like you. It's happening. Thanks to people like Jeffrey Joseph. So, uh, yes, and comment on the, uh, on the YouTube. I'm understanding that people have been, and I'm, I apologize, I haven't been looking at YouTube. I think Jeffrey alluded to the fact that JFOD was on there. John F. O'Donnell, follow him as well, hilarious comedian. Um, and what else? Am I, am I forgetting anything else, folks? Um, Patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. Again, folks, this is not 
this is not like this is not the industry bringing you the Ted Alexandro show. This is not uh, on Netflix. And people say like, why aren't you on Netflix? Why aren't you on this? Why aren't you on that? Look, I am in the studio, the studio headquarters in Astoria, Queens, New York, United States of America. And that is a choice. Why? Because this is my show. This is our show. So why should I uh, turn anything over? Ownership, right? Ownership. I tell this to young comedians all the time. If you can own your albums, own your content, own your stuff, maybe it'll be a little bit more challenging in terms of, uh, you know, seeding things, as they say. Teacher's Lounge, we were talking about it earlier. The way that uh, Hollis and I were able to get that done was a Kickstarter, you know, and that was such a, it was such a heartwarming thing. We raised $50,000 through Kickstarter to, uh, to create this web series, Teacher's Lounge. You, if you haven't seen it, there's 10 episodes on YouTube. Uh, Jeffrey Joseph is in, is in one of those with, with Jim Gaffigan and, and Hollis and myself. Uh, so there's 10 episodes there. But we were able to, to produce that with funding from, from people who wanted to see that project through. And it's so gratifying to create things that way. It is more challenging. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it poses its own kind of, you know, roadblocks at times or challenges, things to overcome. But honestly, there's no other way I would rather do it. So what I'm saying is that is exactly what is happening here with the Ted Alexandro show. So if you are able and inclined, if you enjoy uh, the, the show, if you enjoy the, the comedy that I have produced, uh, if you enjoyed Teacher's Lounge, all of the things, uh, you know, the, the comedy that I post on, on Instagram and, and social media and stuff, uh, you can support that by going to patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. And as I said, my new special cut up is available exclusively on the Patreon. So uh, check that out. I, available at either level. So if you go to patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro, uh, you will see that there. And um, the goal is to grow this show. And also I, I want to, it's important to me to pay everybody who is involved, to pay my producer, to pay my guests. Um, you know, so much of this business is like begging people for favors. And, you know, we all uh, are such a tight community, we would do it, you know, and people are always trying to just help each other out if you have a new project or what have you. But ideally, I would like to remunerate people and to express to them, which is what I, which is how I look at uh, money, actually. That's how I look at cu currency. Uh, I look at it as an expression of I value you. I appreciate you. This is my acknowledgement of you and your contribution. Money isn't real. I've said that before, uh, but my Patreon is. Um, so it, that, that's, you know, that I, I try to look at money as, as, as energy and uh, as affording the opportunity to further create and further bring things into the world. So that's that's what essentially this is. So if you, if you can support uh, at whatever level you're able, that is what you're contributing to. You're contributing to an effort here to continue to build something special, something beautiful, something exciting. So that will be oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. That will be uh, ongoing. And uh, I would like to shout out on that note, some of our patrons who have contributed uh, let's see here. We have, forgive me if I mispronounce, Mojica Fitzgerald. Mojica, Mojica. I think it's Mojica. Thank you, Mojica. We have Bashak. Thank you so much, Bashak. Sean. Simply Sean. Thank you, Sean. Sogal. S O G O L. So Sogal, Sogal, thank you so much. Kate Tuffy, Victor Tran, Francesca Miano, thank you, Fran. Dave Alexandro, 
Not familiar, but thank you. Nina Sanders. Mary Gumbarda. Mary Jumbarda. So thank you all. Mohika, Bashak, Sean, Sogal, Kate, Victor, Fran, Dave, Nina, Mary. What a crew. Your support of the show is deeply appreciated. Uh, it is in, indeed, um, it's invigorating, you know, to, to, to see uh, the, the waves of support that continue to come in. Uh, and as I said, this, we're, we're building, this is our third episode and it's every Monday and Thursday at 7 p.m. live streaming on YouTube. And uh, please just uh, folks, if you're, if you're able, Go to patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro and contribute at whatever label, uh, whatever level you are able. Uh, so again, shout out to all those good folks who have already contributed. And uh, we're going to wrap it up here, folks. Thank you so much, man. I, I feel good. I feel centered. Jeffrey was, was just as, as he described, he was a... Um, uh, that, that reset button, that, that cool stream. I don't know what he, I, I wasn't really listening, Jeffrey. <laughs> no, he described it as like a, a reset. And that's, that, that's how I feel about Jeffrey. He, he does reset my energy. And, uh, and I hope you, you had a similar experience. Uh, reminder again to subscribe to this channel, folks. That's how we're going to build and build and build. So uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, hit the bell for notifications. Next live stream coming Monday at 7 on YouTube. Monthly Zoom AMA for all new patrons, whatever level you join. The first one will be for all levels. Going forward, it will be for only the $20 level. Uh, so that will be coming up. Zoom AMA, uh, Wednesday, July 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. So check patreon.com for details and for a link. Um, Oh, yes. And of course, the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy is live now on the Patreon page. So those of you who joined at the, I believe, at the $20 level will have access to the first episode, the first class of the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy. Whether you are merely a neophyte or just, you know, comedy curious or a uh, seasoned, hardened veteran, there is always something to be learned so, uh, so please check that out, patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. Well, my friends, we did it. What a beautiful, beautiful night. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you for tuning in to episode three of the Ted Alexandro Show. A big thank you, of course, to our producer extraordinaire, the man on the ones and twos. He is Matthew L. Weiss. <laughs> oh yeah there he is <laughs> no doubt he was up to something thank you pro pro dlc for being the man who provides all of the extraordinary music we hear throughout the show and thank you to our executive producer extraordinaire the woman with the vision with the plan who does all of our artwork as well madeline geraldine I love you. <laughs> and please, if you have any questions, uh, you cannot reach me at this text. This text number is not like my number. In case, I don't know if you had any uh, illusion, illusion, illusions, that, uh, that illusions, delusions, that, that was my actual number. Uh, but if you want to reach us when, when the show is not on, when I'm not staring you in the eyes, uh, you can email us here at tedalexandroshow at gmail.com. That's tedalexandroshow at gmail.com. And hit us with any questions, uh, feedback, things that are on your mind, and uh, we will get back to you. All right. My friends, thank you so much uh, again for, for joining us for the Ted Alexandro Show Episode 3. We will see you on Monday for episode four. Be well, my friends. Peace.